Hello, my front porch friend. So good to be with you. I'm glad you could come today and join me. I want you to walk with me just along the creek bank here. I'm out at Kinasarni, of course, with Palmer, heading to this picnic table where I want you to sit down with me. I've got some things I want to share with you that's on my heart. Really a word that I really know is going to be for some of you that are watching tonight. It's been such an unusual week, hasn't it? It's, it's, it's actually even just hard to watch the news these days. Our nation is in pain. So much turmoil and confusion in the streets. You know, as I've watched these past few days, you can't help but look at these things and wonder, God, what is the answer? What is the answer for the injustices that we have seen taking place for the anger and the rage and the spirit of racism that has actually gripped many people's hearts for generations? What, what is the answer for all of this that we are currently experiencing? And I found a scripture this week that I'm sure I've read many, many, many times, but this week it just had life on it for where we are right now. And I believe that contained in these beautiful words are actually the answer that we're looking for. I want you to listen to this. It's found in Matthew, the 12th chapter. And of course, I'm reading in the New Living Translation. Listen to these beautiful words and see if you hear what I hear in them. It says this. Let me see if I can pull my Bible where you can read it with me. I love for you to be able to do that. Look at this. It says this. Look at my servant whom I have chosen. He is my beloved who pleases me. I will put my spirit upon him and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not fight or shout or raise his voice in public. He will not crush the weakest reed or put out a flickering candle. Finally, he will cause justice to be victorious and his name will be the hope of all the world. My friend, those are such beautiful words of hope for us. What is the answer to what we are experiencing right now as a nation? I believe it's found actually in the first sentence there. Look at my servant whom I have chosen. Who is that? It's Jesus. Look at Jesus. The answer for us today, the answer for this rage, the, the answer to the confusion, the answer when we feel hopeless is to lift our eyes and look at Jesus. You know, sometimes it's just good to go and sit again at the foot of the cross. And as you look and as you gaze upon his broken body, just pray, God, show me how to love like you love. Show me how to give the way you gave yourself and show me how to forgive when you've been treated so unjustly. I think whenever we see him, it begins to help us remember we are not of this world. We are of his kingdom and from his kingdom. And when you begin to feel hopeless, just begin to speak that name. Jesus. And whenever you're just looking up at him, just start saying his name out loud. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. That's what Matthew said. And the Holy Spirit said through him, his name will be the hope for all the world. What is the hope right now for our nation? Jesus. What is the answer to these unthinkable things that are happening right now in the streets of America. It's Jesus. I believe the stage is being set for a great awakening. And as intercessors and spiritual mothers that are watching me right now, that's how we have to pray. God, bring an awakening to the hearts of people. But for many of you watching right now, you are, not, you are facing not only a national crisis, but many of you are facing a personal crisis. Many of you are facing the same turmoil in a different way within your own home. It's a crisis in your marriage. Many of you are facing a crisis with your prodigal children, a 
crisis in your finances, a crisis in your physical body or your job. The Lord gave me a word to share with someone that was going to be watching tonight that feels exactly that. You feel trapped. You feel like you do not know what to do because you've done everything you know to do. You can't go forward. You can't go back. And the Lord told me to tell you this. It's out of Exodus, the 14th chapter and the 13th verse. Here's his words to you. Stand still and see the salvation of your God. Oh, my friend, just stand still. And see your God. Stand still and look at Jesus. Now, when you first hear those words, you think, well, you know, stand still. Okay, that's easy enough. Well, <laughs> sometimes standing still is not an easy thing to do. Ask Moses. He's the first one that said it. Those are the words actually of Moses, who was a man who literally, you talk about somebody that felt trapped. I'm going to have to stand up. I'm already stirred up when I think about this. Moses was a man who had the, the Egyptians coming behind him. He had the Red Sea in front of him. He had complaining Israelites on either side of him. Talk about trapped. And Moses' response was not to turn around and look at the Egyptians and stare at them. His response was not to be overwhelmed by the Red Sea in front of him. And his response was not to even be moved by the people screaming in his ears. His response to everything around him was stand still and see the salvation of our God. Oh, that sounds easy until you're standing in that place when, when all of these things are swirling around you. What we want to do is we want to do anything besides stand still. We want to move. We want to run. Honey, we'll take off swimming in the Red Sea and just hope for the best. Or we'll pull out our sword and get ready to come up with some battle strategy to fight the enemy in the flesh and be destroyed by it. Or we get moved by the people that's screaming in our ears, another plan, a better plan. Let's go back to Egypt. Let's forget this. No, standing still can sometimes be one of the most challenging things that you can do unless you know where to look. You say, how do you stand still? What does standing still even look like? Well, first of all, let me tell you what it doesn't look like. It doesn't look like standing still and worrying. God never called you to stand still and worry. It's just, he's never called you to stand still and just stand there going, oh God. Oh, God, have you seen how deep the water is in front of me? God, the enemy's behind me. I can hear the hoofs of the horses. Oh, God, it's overwhelming. It's impossible. There's no way we're going to get through this. God, there's no way it's impossible. God, I'm believing what the people are telling me. God, oh, oh God, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know if you can do this. God, help us. Lord, will you help us? Will you help us? God, will you help us? That's not what he's calling you to do. Worry is no acceptable or excusable sin. Sometimes people wear worry like a badge. You know, my mother was a worry and my grandma was a worrier. My whole family's been worriers. We're just a family of worriers. Well, honey, worry is no legacy to leave behind. Faith is. The reason worry is deadly is because worry is always intertwined with unbelief. And unbelief is a grave sin because unbelief questions the very character of God. Unbelief questions whether or not he'll keep his word. Well, you know, I don't know if he'll do it. I, I don't really do it. I know he can, but I'm not sure he will. I'm not sure. I know he gave me a promise, but I'm not sure he'll keep his word. It sounds like somebody in the garden, if I think about it right now, named Lucifer, who said to Eve, did God say, da, 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 da. That's how Satan always works. Did God, he tries to make you question God. Questioning whether or not he can really be trusted. Listen. Unbelief is such a big deal. In Revelations 21, 
the unbelievers are listed in the same verse with the murderers and the adulterers and those who are eternally separated from God. It's a big deal to question the character of God. It's a big deal to question whether or not God can be trusted. And I know that many of you right now watching, it's challenging for you to trust. In fact, in your life, many times the very people that were the closest to you hurt you the most when you did trust them. And so you've been hurt and let down so many times by people that you trusted, that you just built a wall up and said, I'll never trust anybody again. I don't trust anybody, especially these days when you're even, <laughs> when you're even just watching our news. It's like, who do you believe? What do we listen to? Who do you trust? Let me tell you this. I think we've all learned. People will always let us down. People, even sometimes with the best intentions, will always fail. We're all fallible. There is only one. There is only one who will never fail. Only one who will never change. I know people can leave us and betray us, but there is only one who will never leave you or forsake you. Only one. There is only one who is faithful and true. There is only one who is worthy to be trusted. We can trust him when we do not understand him because we know we trust his love for us supersedes the understanding of our circumstances. Because even though we can't see what's happening in our life right now, and it makes no sense, and it looks like our promises are not even coming to pass, we can trust this God. I don't even understand what's happening, but I know this about you. I know I can trust your love for me enough that even though I don't understand what's happening, you're going to somehow work all of this together for my good. He can be trusted, my friend. What he's calling on you to do today. When you stand still, what does that look like? It looks like getting your eyes up off these circumstances. It means cutting out the other voices. Sometimes you just need to turn off the news for a while and just get into the realm of the spirit and hear and see where he is and say, God, I want to hear what you have to say. Lord, I lift up my eyes to just gaze at Jesus. Do you remember that song from years ago? Remember it? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. That's what Moses did. Moses did not stand there worrying. Moses did not, was not moved by people. Moses lifted up his eyes and he said, stand still and see the salvation of our God. Oh no, standing still is no easy thing to do. It takes the it takes the greatest faith you've ever experienced to say, God, there is no other way but you, but I know you are my deliverer. Moses could have said, God, I don't know how you're going to do it. I don't know what you're going to do, but I know this. I'm going to stand right here still in my faith with you, with my eyes set upon you because you are my deliverer. Moses lifted his eyes. Moses lifted his rod. And when he lifted his rod, you know what God did? God parted the water and made a way through the sea. God made a way through the impossibility. God made a way where there was no way. Oh, my friend, when you lift up your eyes and say, God, I don't know how you're going to fix my marriage. I don't know how you're going to bring my prodigal home. I don't know how you're going to help us financially. I don't know how my body will be healed, but I know that you will keep your word. I know, God, that you can be trusted. I don't know how you're going to do it. I I just know you're going to make a way. Right now, it seems like there is no way, but that's when you shine the brightest. Come on, my friend. Set your eyes on him. Do what Matthew told us to do. Look at my servant. 
Lift up your eyes and look at Jesus. Hebrews 12 says that too. Hebrews 12 says, he says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. In fact, that's such a good word. If you'll give me a second, I'm just going to look it up right here. Turn right to it. Love it when that happens. Look at this, please. He says, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. And now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Watch this. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. And then you will not become weary and give up. My friend, you can't give up today. I know you may be weary, but you can't give up. Set your eyes on him. Let me tell you one more thing. When you look at Jesus, you know, I tell you what, you won't see. You won't see a worried Jesus. This Jesus that the, that the writer of Hebrews said is now seated in the place of honor at God's right hand. When you look up at Jesus, you'll never see a worried Jesus. I have to tell you this. I have one sister and her name is Janet and she is uh, married to a man named Skip who is a pastor and uh, they've pastored now for many, many years, different churches. And several years ago when my sister Janet and Skip were going through a very tough time in their ministry, just a hard season. And they'd stayed up. Actually, they, they, they determined that they were going to stay up for several nights at night and just pray through the night. That, that was their strategy that they received, that they would just pray through the night. Well, one night as they were praying, both of them together in the morning hours, they were, they were praying in the living room. And Janet, my sister, she said Skip was just in the floor, just with his face to the floor. And she said he was just on the floor, just praying and with all of his heart and weeping and praying and weeping. And Janet said, this is, Janet said, I looked up, oh, and she said, standing in the doorway of my kitchen was Jesus. She said, I saw him. And she said, when I looked up, she said, I could hardly believe what I was looking at, that I could see him. And she said, what I noticed, the first thing I noticed was that he had a smile on his face. She said, Skip and I were just worried terrible about this. We were burdened. We were heavy. We were stressed. She said, but when I looked at Jesus's face, she said, there was no worry. She said, he just was smiling at me. She said, he began to walk toward me. And she said, I was looking. She said, I was going, Skip, 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 Skip. Jesus is here. Well, Skip, you know, he didn't realize she was looking at him. He, she said he never, she said Skip never even lifted his face. She said he just kept his face to the floor just weeping and sobbing and praying. She said, I just kept looking at Jesus. She said Jesus walked up and she said he walked over past her and he looked down at Skip and then he looked back at Janet and he said this, tell Skip I've come to take his burden. Oh, my friend, I believe right now Jesus brought us together for this moment because he's come to tell you he has come to take your burden. He's in your kitchen, too. He's in your living room. He's wherever you're watching this. He's so much closer than you realize. You've had your eyes on the wrong things and your ears listening to wrong people and wrong influences. Turn around and look at him. Look in his beautiful face. Look in his face of peace and his eyes of love. And just take that burden you've been carrying and saying, God, this is too big for me. So I'm going to turn around and I'm just going to give it to you, Jesus. Because he can only take now what you release to him. It's time to let it go. He's come to take your burden, Father. I thank you that you are with my friend right now. Jesus, you are a present help in the time of trouble. You are not far away.
And I know they've been asking you, where are you? Lord, let them know right now that you are right beside them, so near, present, in the middle of the fire, in the middle of the circumstances. I know that you are the healer of broken hearts. I know that today you are the one that says, cast your care upon me because I care for you. Lord, help them right now to release this. I declare in the name of Jesus, worry and that, that spirit of heaviness is being broken and a garment of praise is being placed on my friend. Right now, Lord, give her a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Give her joy where there's been sorrow. Give her perfect love when there's been fear and despair. And Lord, we declare right now as we speak your name, my friend, just start speaking his name. Start saying it, Jesus, Jesus. Start saying it out loud, Jesus, Jesus. Lord, your name is the hope of all the world. Your name is the hope of our heart. Your name is the hope for our family. Your name is the hope for this marriage. Your name is the hope for the prodigal. Lord, your name is our healer. Your name, Jesus, you are our healer. Jesus, you are our provider. Jesus, you are our salvation. And today we lift up our eyes and we see you, and you are enough. My friend, he's there, and he's gonna make a way where there seems to be no way. Don't be weary and don't give up. He's answering your prayers. God's moving for your child right now. He's moving, he's working. You can never stop in Jesus' name. He's gonna give you strength. I hear that right now, God is giving you strength to keep believing. Don't be weary in well-doing, for in due season, you're going to reap if you faint not. In Jesus' name, comment below and let me hear what God is speaking to your heart today. Oh, I feel his presence so strong right here with me talking to you. Just comment below and let me hear what the Lord is saying to you. And uh, let me hear how the Lord has been answering your prayers. I love you, my friend. I love our time together. I look forward to seeing you again next week. So until then. Keep your eyes on him. I'll see you later.